Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Please welcome the 1999-2000 President of the International Society for Performance Improvement, Dale Brethauer. Buenos dias. Bonjour. Ohio gazaimas. Good morning. Welcome to Cincinnati. Welcome to the International Society for Performance Improvement Conference 2000. The International Society for Performance Improvement is a group of caring people with a worthy mission, a powerful methodology, and positive ideals. It is to improve human performance in the workplace, any workplace, small or large, anywhere in the world. Our methodology is powerful. We can describe what we will accomplish, how we will accomplish it, and the value of accomplishing it now and in the future. Our ideals are positive. We improve human performance to help create a better world for each one and everyone. The Conference 2000 theme is making connections, making connections among people, between people and human performance technology and opportunities to use the technology to make a better world. When we build instructional systems, we add knowledge and skill that enables people to accomplish valued results. When we build performance systems, we add value by helping, uh, providing people with the support they must have to achieve results. The performance support leverages value. Making connections that add value. That's what Conference 2000 is all about. It's what human performance technology is about. It's what ISPI members are all about. Welcome to three days of making connections. Our speaker this morning has an important message related to the conference theme. Our world is interconnected. Thomas Friedman has written about the implications of connectedness in his best-selling book, The Lexus and the Olive Tree, Understanding Globalization. Thomas Friedman is a thinking journalist. He pursues the crucial information behind the story. He gets both sound bites and substance. His credentials demonstrate why he has earned our attention this morning. Born in Minneapolis, educated at Brandeis and Oxford, former bureau chief in Beirut and in Jerusalem, recipient of a National Book Award in 1988 for his bestseller, From Beirut to Jerusalem, winner of not one, but two Pulitzer Prizes for his international reporting as foreign affairs columnist for the New York Times. When you hear him, you will understand why he appears frequently on Face the Nation. As impressive as his credentials are, stay tuned. His career is on the rise. Please join me in giving an ISPI welcome to Thomas Friedman. I'm not going to sing. <laughs> I heard that. Um, I'm going to spend the next uh, half hour or so talking about my book, The Lexus and the Olive Tree, and um, the analysis behind it. I know uh, some of you here have, have read it. Uh, those of you who haven't, I know who you are. I know exactly who and uh, I'll be autographing copies at 11 o'clock in the bookstore. Um, the Lexus and the Olive Tree really grows out of my job as the foreign affairs columnist for the New York Times, and so I really have to start there. It's really the source of my analysis. I, I have the best job in the world. I mean, somebody has to have it. I've got it, and you don't. I get to be a tourist with an attitude. I get to travel all over the world where, wherever I want, whenever I want, and write whatever I want, about whatever I want. It's a great job. There's only one downside with my job, and that's that I have to have attitudes twice a week. In fact, in my case, they have to come every Tuesday and every Friday on the op-ed page of the New York Times. So the big challenge I had when I started this job was, in, in January 1995, was what attitudes? What attitudes? 
Why go here and not there? Why, why write this and not that? Now, I'm actually the fifth foreign affairs columnist for the New York Times. The first was a woman named Anne O'Hare McCormick. And Anne McCormick started with the Times in 1937. She got her job according to her highly politically incorrect obit in the New York Times. She got her start accompanying her husband, who was an engineer from Dayton, Ohio, on buying trips to Europe. And she started stringing for the Times and writing for the Times, and they liked her stuff, so they anointed her with the first foreign affairs column in the New York Times, which in 1937 was called In Europe. Because as far as the New York Times was concerned in 1937, In Europe was foreign affairs. In fact, the title of the column only changed to foreign affairs in 1954 with the advent of the Cold War. Now, Anne O'Hare McCormick's super story, the framework within which she wrote and shaped her attitudes, was the crumbling of Versailles Europe and World War II. Her three successors had the Cold War as their super story and framework for their attitudes. I started in January 1995, as I said, when the Cold War had just ended and it was not clear what is the new framework, what is the new super story out there that should be the organizing principle for my attitudes. And the Lexus and the Olive Tree is really my answer to that question. And the answer, in short, is globalization. The basic argument of the book is that globalization is not a trend, it's not a fad, it's not a Nintendo game. It is the international system that replaced the Cold War system. And like the Cold War system, globalization has its own rules, logic, pressures, and incentives that will and do affect everyone's company, community, and country. Now, I define globalization as the integration of markets, finance, and technologies in a way that is shrinking the world from a size medium to a size small and enabling each of, <coughs> excuse me, and enabling each of us to reach around the world farther, faster, deeper, and cheaper than ever before and enabling the world to reach into each of us farther, faster, deeper, cheaper than ever before. Now the best way to really understand what globalization means for our countries, our communities, and our countries is to compare the globalization system with the Cold War system. <clears throat> the Cold War system was characterized by one overarching feature and that was division, division. The world was a divided place in the Cold War system, and all your threats and opportunities as a country or a company tended to flow from who you were divided from. And that system was symbolized by a single word, the wall, the Berlin Wall. The globalization system is also characterized by one overarching feature, integration. In this system, now all your threats and opportunities tend to flow from who you're connected to, and it is symbolized by a single word, the web, the World Wide Web. So we've gone from a world of division and walls to a world of integration and webs. In the Cold War, we reached for the hotline, which was a symbol that we were all divided, but thank God, at least two people were in charge the United States and the Soviet Union. In globalization, we reach for the internet, which is a symbol that we're all connected and nobody's in charge. Yeah, this system is just like the internet. We are all increasingly connected and nobody's quite in charge. Now, if the Cold War had been a sport, it would have, without question, been sumo wrestling. <laughs> Two big, fat guys in a ring, lots of rituals stomping around and grunting and painted face and feathers, but not a lot of contact. 
until the very end of the match when one fat guy finally pushed the other fat guy out of the ring. If globalization were a sport, it would be the 100 meter dash over and over and over and over. And if you lose by a tenth of a second, it's like you lost by a week. And the only thing that victory assures is that you get to race again the next morning. The Cold War system was a system built around weight. You wanted a big, fat company or country to compete in that system. The globalization system is built around speed. In the Cold War, the first question we asked was, how big is your missile? In globalization, the first question we ask is, how fast is your modem? In the Cold War, the second question we asked was, who are you divided from? In globalization, the second question we ask is, who are you connected to? The ideal equation for the Cold War was E equals MC squared. The ideal equation for globalization is Moore's law, that the speed of microchips will double every 18 months and the price will have. Oh, the ideal document in the Cold War was the treaty. The ideal document in globalization is the deal. The ideal economists in the Cold War were Marx and Keynes. They wanted to tame capitalism, each in their own way. The ideal economists in globalization are Schumpeter and Andy Grove, the chairman of Intel. Schumpeter because he believed that globalization, sorry, he believed that capitalism was about creative destruction, the ability and willingness of your country or company to shoot its wounded and quickly transfer their dead capital to more efficient producers. And Andy Grove of Intel, who took his insight from Schumpeter about life in Silicon Valley and titled his book, Only the Paranoid Survive. Two very different systems. Now what truly distinguishes these two systems is how power, how power is structured within them. The Cold War system was a state-based system. That is to say, you and I acted on the world stage through our state. And the story of the Cold War was a story of states balancing states, aligning with states, and confronting states. It was a state-based system. What is different about globalization is that rather being built on just one balance, the balance between states, it's now built on three balances. The first is the balance between states and states. That still matters today. Whether it's the U.S. balancing Russia, Russia balancing China, Japan balancing Korea, the balance of power between states today still matters. But now we have two new balances to keep track of. The first is the balance between states and what I call the supermarkets. The supermarkets are the 25 largest global stock, bond, and currency markets in the world which today have become autonomous geopolitical actors in many ways independent of states. Who ousted Suharto in Indonesia? Oh, it was not another superpower. It was the supermarkets. The United States can destroy you by dropping bombs. The supermarkets can destroy you by downgrading your bonds. Take your choice. So now we have states and states states and supermarkets. Thirdly, and most uniquely, in the globalization system we now have states and what I call super empowered people. Yeah, you see what happens when you blow away the walls and you start to wire the world into networks? What it means is that individuals, you and I, can become super empowered. And that means we can act on the world stage directly, unmediated by a state. Jody Williams, two years ago, won the Nobel Peace Prize for organizing a global ban on landmines against the wishes of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. She was asked afterwards, how did you do that? And she had a very short answer, email. She basically used email to galvanize a thousand NGOs on five continents 
into a movement against landmines that trump the wishes of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. Do you remember that story a few years ago, Time, Warner, CNN reported, that American troops used poison gas during the Vietnam War? Very controversial story. Peter Arnett basically lost his job over it. Very controversial story. CNN at the time had a retired general working for them as a military consultant. His name was Perry Smith, General Perry Smith. When that story worked its way up the news chain in CNN and hit his desk, he said, that story is bogus, and if you run it, I quit. And Time Warner, CNN, the world's biggest media conglomerate, said, bye-bye, bye-bye. We're Time Warner, CNN, the world's biggest media conglomerate. We don't take threats from retired generals around here. Perry Smith went home, got on his email network, emailed his five closest general friends from the Vietnam War. They emailed their five closest colonel friends from the Vietnam War. They emailed their five closest captain friends from the Vietnam War. In the space of seven days, without the benefit of the Freedom of Information Act or a single document out of the Pentagon, they assembled a dossier on their own so compelling that it brought Time Warner CNN to its knees, begging for mercy, apologizing on its own network, recanting its story, and promising never to do it again to five retired generals with emails. <laughs> who got super empowered. Now, excuse me. Unfortunately, there aren't just super empowered nice people in this world. A lot of people get super empowered when you blow away the walls and wire the world into networks. Last year I was in Israel. I flew home from Tel Aviv directly to Chicago. Not home, I flew back to the States. Got in early in the morning, was staying in a big chain hotel in Chicago, couldn't sleep, put on my bathing suit, went down to the pool, shoved my room key in my pocket, lost the key in the pool. Went back to the front desk, said, hi, I'm Tom Friedman, room 1702, lost my key, need another one. They said, show me some ID. <laughs> I said, I'm in my bathing suit, I have no ID. Girl said, no problem, said, no problem. She went to her computer, punched a few buttons, and then said, what are the names and ages of your two daughters? I'd stayed in this hotel a year earlier for Thanksgiving with my family. Oh, I gave her their names and ages, and she gave me my key. But I couldn't help but wondering what else they had on me in that computer. You see, what happens in this system is the big threat is not big brother, folks. It's little brother. Oh, beware of little brother. Beware of all the hotels and video stores, all the double clicks and websites that can get super empowered and gather all kinds of information on you in ways you wouldn't even begin to know and market it to people who you couldn't imagine. It's little brother that is the real threat in this system. Now there aren't just little brothers and super empowered nice guys. There are also getting super empowered angry men Osama bin Laden, the Saudi millionaire who blew up two American embassies in East Africa two years ago, he was a super-empowered, angry man. And he had his own network, too. A kind of jihad online, J-O-L, which he used to take on the United States of America. And you know what we did to Osama bin Laden? I have no regrets about this, but I find it fascinating. We fired. 77 cruise missiles at him at a million dollars each. Think about that for a second. Think about that. We fired 77 cruise missiles at a person. <laughs> you don't see that every day. That was a superpower against a super-empowered, angry man. Ramzi Yusuf, remember Ramzi? 
Ramsey was the lovely character who tried to blow up the two tallest buildings in America, the World Trade Center, five years ago. I always wondered, what did Ramzi Yusuf want? Did he want a Palestinian state in Brooklyn? <laughs> did he want an Islamic Republic in New Jersey? What did he want? So for my book, I went back and reread the court case, and what he wanted was to blow up the two tallest buildings in America. <laughs> Period, paragraph, ended. Globalization as Americanization had gotten in his face, and it had empowered him as an individual to do something about it. And the only reason we got Ramzi Yusuf, the only reason, was because remarkably, one of his fellow bombers went back to the Ryder Rental Truck Agency after the bombing and asked for the $400 deposit back <laughs> on the truck they used, claiming it had been stolen. You couldn't make this stuff up. <laughs> but itself, it's a wonderful story. In the morning, you blow up the World Trade Center on the basis of your rage with America. And in the afternoon, you use American contract law to get your deposit back. <laughs> well, that tipped off the FBI to Ramzi Youssef. They trailed him around the world. They finally tracked him to an apartment in the Philippines. They broke in. They broke in and found all his plots exactly where he kept them, on the C drive of his Toshiba laptop. That is where Ramzi Yusuf kept his plots. He was a super-empowered, angry man. Now, if you really want to get scared when you go to bed tonight, and you tuck yourself in, think about this, it's not that Osama bin Laden or Ramzi Yusuf can or ever will be superpowers. What's really scary is how many people in this system can be Ramzi Yusuf and Osama bin Laden. That's what's new. Now, if my daughters were here, the next question they would ask is, Daddy, wh wh where did globalization come from? What blew away all the walls? Now, quickly, the argument I make in the book is what blew away the walls were three simultaneous, I call them democratizations, democratizations, that were born in the Cold War system, gained strength in this system, and converged at the end of the 1980s into a whirlwind that blew away all the walls. The first of these was the democratization of finance. You know, there was nothing more anti-democratic in America in the 1950s than bank lending. You wanted to start a business, you wanted to get a bank loan, you needed to know somebody at the bank, you needed an in. Well, thanks to the creation of a home mortgage security market, a commercial paper market, Michael Milken's junk bond market, right up to last year, David Bowie, the rock star, issued $55 million in David Bowie bonds. Yes, you too now can be rated AAA. Finance has been increasingly democratized in this country, as has pension investing. I dare say my own father probably had no idea where his pension was invested. We now move ours around from Magellan large cap to Fidelity small cap to Vanguard overseas three times a day, depending on who is performing best. In fact, there's a wonderful commercial on television for E-Trade that really illustrates the democratization of finance. I don't know if you've ever seen this. This guy's driving down the street in his convertible with his golf club sticking out of the back seat. And a motorcycle cop pulls him over, says, let's see your license. The guy takes out his license, shows it to the cop. The cop says, J Jerry Jones, why, you're the manager of my mid-cap mutual fund. <laughs> guy says, as a matter of fact, I am. Cop says, you were in the top 10 mutual fund managers last year. Guy says, as a matter of fact, I was. Cop says, but you weren't in the top five. So let's get back to work. <laughs> and the last scene in the commercial is the policeman carrying away his golf clubs. <laughs> but underlying that commercial is a very interesting statement. It's that even the cop on the beat now knows where his pension is invested 
and is tracking it and keeping tabs on who's doing well and who isn't. That is the democratization of finance. The second democratization, which I don't have to tell this group about, is the democratization of technology, thanks to microchips and PCs and the phenomena of digitization, the alchemy by which we take words and music and data, turn them into ones and zeros, transmit them over modems, and they come out the other end as perfect copies of those original words, music, and data. Thanks to digitization, the PC and the microchip, technology has increasingly been democratized. The last democratization is the democratization of information. Thanks to satellites and cell phones, pagers and fiber optics, we all now increasingly know how each other lives. The days when the Soviet newspaper Pravda could run a front page picture of Americans in New York City waiting outside of Zabar's Delicatessen at 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning for the deli to open under the headlines, look, bread lines in America too. <laughs> oh, those days are over, kids. Don't try that trick at home. Not in this system. Not when we all increasingly know how each other lives. Now, essentially what has happened in the 1980s is that these three democratizations, as I said, converged. And they created a whirlwind, which we call in shorthand the information revolution, but it went far beyond information, that blew away all the walls, created a whole new set of efficiencies in the marketplace and economies of scale, and a whole new place to do business called cyberspace. If your company, or your country, or your society, or your university, understood these three democratizations and absorbed them and applied them to your way of life or your business, you thrived in the new era without walls. If you didn't, the Berlin Wall fell on you. That's right, the fall of the Berlin Wall was not a European event. It certainly wasn't a German event. It was a global event. Any fat, bloated, sclerotic, overweight country or company that could not absorb the democratization of finance, technology, and information had the Berlin Wall fall on it. Which is why it is no accident at all that the Soviet Union, IBM, East Germany and General Motors all tanked at the same time. They all got hit with the exact same historical force. IBM and GM adjusted, the Soviet Union and East Germany didn't, and they are not with us anymore. Now when the walls fell, the guts of this new globalization system got created. And let me talk about that, sort of four key parts for a second. The first thing that happened, the first part of this system, is what happens when the walls fall. And what happens when the walls fall, in simple terms, and it's great to speak to this audience because you'll know exactly what I mean, when the walls fall, it means the barriers to entry around everyone's company and country start to shrink, if not collapse. And when that happens, the speed at which you move from innovation to commoditization, the speed at which you move from having a high value-added product or service protected by high barriers to entry and high walls for which you can charge a lot of money, therefore, the speed at which you move from having that to having your product or service turned into a commodity that anyone can make and the only differentiation is price. The speed at which you move from innovation to commoditization in a world of walls is 10 miles an hour. The speed at which you'll move from innovation to commoditization in a world without walls is 110 miles an hour. And fasten your seat belts and put your seat backs and tray tables into a fixed upright position because with the internet, that's going to move to 510 miles an hour. 
Do you all know how a compact computer got created, really got its start? Compact got its start because back in 1985-86, Intel came out with a new chip called the 386 chip, which was faster than the 286 chip. They came to their biggest customer, IBM Big Blue, lived in a world of walls. Nobody can threaten us. They said, we've got the 386 chip. Run with it. Make a new computer. IBM said, you know, we just came out with the AT. Remember the AT? Stood for Advanced Technology. <laughs> and we basically were telling our customers, if they get an AT, they're not going to need a new computer for five years. So we're saving the 386 chip for our whole new system, the PS2. So we're going to take a pass on it for now. And hey, we're IBM. We're big blue. So eat it, Intel. Little company down in Houston called Compaq spelled their name funny, had a Q on the end. Said, we'll take that 386 chip. And in 24 months, they ate IBM's lunch in the PC business. They caught IBM with its walls down in a paradigm shift. Now, the best way I can illustrate to you what happens when the walls fall is with a real live ad I came across while writing my book in an airline magazine. Because when the walls fall, we're all in each other's business. Now this ad was for the Sony Mavica camera. And I saw this ad and I thought, Sony Mavica camera? That's interesting. I didn't know Sony made cameras. I thought they made CDs and Walkman and stereos. Oh, it's a very interesting ad. It has three pictures in it. The first is of the Sony Mavica camera, and under it it says, this is your camera. Next to it is a three and a half inch floppy disk. Under that it says, this is your film. Next to that is a computer with a baby picture on it. Under that it says, this is your post office. Now what is that ad saying? What that ad is saying is that someone at Sony headquarters woke up one morning and said, hey, what are we? I mean, what are we? We're just a big factory for digitizing stuff. It happens we've been digitizing music all these years. But what the heck when you can digitize anything, and if you're good at it, we can digitize anything. We can digitize your baby pictures. We can be Kodak. That ad basically says Sony woke up one morning and said, we are Sony, and by the way, we're now also Kodak. Then someone down in shipping and receiving in Sony headquarters said, you know, while we're being Sony and Kodak, why don't we transmit those pictures around the world to your kids on modems from Auckland to Alabama to Cincinnati? Why don't we also be Federal Express? That ad says we are now Sony, we are now Kodak, we are now Federal Express. Oh, I saw that ad and I thought, wow, what do the people at Kodak think? So I'm driving in my car, I hear an ad for Kodak on the radio, and they're advertising all their computer internet services. They're talking like a PC company now. So I go down to Houston for my book, interview the people at Compaq Computer. I ask them how they feel about Kodak becoming a PC company. They say, we're not worried about Kodak, we had Compaq now, we're like a big consulting firm. Our motto is Compaq, better answers. We do business solutions. Look at our ads. They don't even show pictures of the computer anymore. They just say Compaq, better answers. We're in the business solutions business. Oh, you're in business solutions. Interesting. So a couple weeks later, I'm out with a friend of mine. He works for PricewaterhouseCoopers, the business solutions people. I ask him how he feels about Compaq going into the business solutions business. He says, we're not worried about Compaq, but we're terrified of Goldman Sachs because they're not going into the tax derivative and advice business. He suggests I read a book about it. I go home, tell my wife I'm going to Borders, pick up a book. She says, don't go to Borders. Go to Borderless Books, Amazon.com. So I go downstairs. I call up Amazon.com on my computer, and what's the first thing I see? But they're now selling CDs. I say, wait a minute, wasn't that Sony's business? <laughs> when the walls fall, we are all in each other's business. 
And when that happens, hold on to your hats, because the speed at which you'll move from innovation to commoditization will be turbocharged. I told this story to the booksellers of my publisher, Farrar Strauss and Giroux. Guy stands up in the audience, Mark Gates, the chief Farrar Strauss bookseller in the Midwest. He says, Mr. Friedman, I got to tell you a story. I just came from Brooks Brothers department store. I was in the men's suit department, looking to buy a men's suits, and what do I suit? What do I see? But they're selling a stack of Michael Jordan's new book there for the love of the game for 30% off on a pile of men's suits. I go up to the head of the men's suit department, I say, how would you like it if I sold men's suits in my bookstores? He said, have you looked at your Con Edison electric bill lately? Con Edison is offering the Jordan book for 40% off for for Christmas, and you can now charge it on your electric bill. <laughs> when the walls fall, we are all in each other's business. We had a wonderful headline in the business pages of the New York Times a couple months ago about AT&T diversifying into all these businesses. It said, AT&T, ma everything. And everybody today is increasingly ma everything. I was at the Davos World Economic Forum two years ago, and there was a press breakfast with Bill Gates of Microsoft. And the reporters were all asking him, Mr. Gates, these internet stocks, they're a bubble, aren't they? I mean, come on. They're a bubble, aren't they? Surely they're a bubble. They must be a bubble. Come on, they're a bubble. <laughs> Finally, Gates said, look, you bozos, of course they're a bubble. Anyone who knows anything about technology knows you can't project the future earnings of a technology company 10 years out. I don't know if Microsoft's going to be here in four years. You're telling me Amazon.com does? But, says Mr. Gates, you're all missing the point. Because this bubble is attracting so much capital to this Internet industry, it is going to drive innovation faster and faster. Same day, by coincidence, I went to interview President Hosni Mubarak of Egypt. Afterwards, I'm sitting around with some Egyptian friends of mine, wanted to talk about the, what their president had to say, including my friend Imad, he runs the Egyptian kind of business week. He said to me, Mr. Tom, Mr. Tom, we understand now we've got to get on this globalization train, but could you slow it down a little bit for us? <laughs> I said, Imad, I'd love to slow it down, especially for you, but there's nobody driving. You find me the person driving and I'll slow down the train. Everyone in this system is always looking for somebody to call 1-800, slow down the train, 911, give me a break. Let me tell you a little secret. I don't want you to let it out of this room. I was in Secretary of the Treasury Robert Rubin's office, oh yeah, and he didn't have a phone on his desk because he knew better than anyone there's nobody to call. <laughs> there is nobody to call, and you can waste a lot of time in this system looking for somebody to call. So that's the first part of this system, what happens when the walls fall. Let's look quickly at the other three parts. Excuse me. The second part of this system is a new political garment we all have to put on. I call that garment the golden straitjacket. The golden straitjacket embodies all the rules of the globalization system, rules about deficit to GDP ratios, inflation, privatization, deregulation, foreign trade, all the rules we consider neoliberalism. Margaret Thatcher was the original seamstress of the golden straitjacket with buttons and tailoring provided by Ronald Reagan. It is the only style on the rack this historical season. If you want to join the globalization system, you've got to put on this golden straitjacket. Now, two things happen to your country when it puts on the golden straitjacket. The first thing that happens is your economy grows from more deregulation, private trade, foreign investment. Your economy grows and your politics shrinks yeah, your economy grows and your political choices narrow to Pepsi or Coke. 
to mere nuances of taste tolerated by the golden straight jacket. Would somebody please tell me what were the differences between John McCain, George W. Bush, Bill Bradley, and Al Gore on fundamental economic questions? It was four guys talking about the tailoring of a golden straight jacket. One wanted to loosen the buttons a little, another wanted to put some padding in the elbows, but that's all it was about. Patty Ashdown, the third party leader in Britain, the Liberal Party leader, he looked at John Major and Tony Blair in their election campaign a couple of years ago, listened to what they were saying about economic policy on the campaign trail, and pronounced synchronized swimming. <laughs> synchronized swimming. Well, for better and often for worse, I see synchronized swimming all over the world today between ruling and opposition parties in countries that have put on the golden straitjacket. Now, the third part of this system is a new energy source. That new energy source I call the electronic herd. The electronic herd. The electronic herd are all those investors out there, for many of you at home trading online on E-Trade, right up to the big multinational corporations of Ford, GM, Intel, Compaq, and the big multinational banks. This herd existed in the Cold War, but that world was so chopped up, fenced up, and divided up that it could never really gather and graze and grow and gain strength. But as the walls got blown away, and as governments had to put on a golden straitjacket and run balanced budgets, this herd has really been able to gather, graze, grow, and gain strength, and travel all over the world, and it is now the energy source of the globalization system. If you want to grow, you have to plug into the herd as a community, a company, or a country. And a big part of politics today is how do I manage the relationship between my company and my country or my community and the electronic herd? Plug into it right and it's like a high voltage wire. It'll light up your company or community. Plug into it wrong and it'll burn a hole right through you faster than anything we have seen in the history of the world. Which is why the last part of this system is really about how do I relate to the herd? Now, I like to compare countries to computers. It is as though today we all, for the first time in the history of the world, have the same basic piece of hardware, same basic computer, free markets. Mexico's got free markets and Russia's got them. China's got them and Indonesia's got them. Brazil's got them and we've got them. For the first time in history, say for Cuba and North Korea, we all today have basically the same computer. The question is, who will get the operating system and the software to put in that computer? So when you plug into the electronic herd, you get the most out of it and cushion the worst. Now, operating system in my lexicon are all the economic rules of the golden straitjacket. And software is the rule of law, courts, regulatory institutions, free press, and democracy. Russia was like a computer at the end of the Cold War that plugged into the electronic herd with no operating system and no software inside. And when the herd surged, as it inevitably does, it melted down whatever tangled mess of wires was that Russian economy. Thailand, Korea, Malaysia, Indonesia, they plugged into the herd, but with a very slow operating system, one that I call DOS Capital 1.0. <laughs> now, DOS Capital 1.0 is great for getting your country from $500 per capita income to $5,000, but when the herd moves from a 286 chip to a Pentium 3, and you're still running DOS Capital 1.0, better known as crony capitalism. What happens to your country is what happens to your computer if you try to run Windows 2000 on your kid's old 286 AT. A little sign pops up on your screen says you have misallocated all your resources. Cannot move capital. Please download new operating system and software. Alt function delete. And that's what Malaysia, Korea, Thailand, that's what they're doing today, trying to go from DOS Capital 1.0 to DOS Capital 
That's the system in a nutshell. Let me conclude with just a couple of points. Uh, the penultimate chapter of my book is called If You'd Like to Speak to a Human Being, Press 1. And what it's about is really, is this system irreversible? Is it irreversible? And my conclusion is it's quite reversible, or it's certainly theoretically reversible. There are real threats to this system, and the, that chapter is about those, those threats. There are many. I'll share just two of them with you quickly. I think maybe the biggest threat to this system is what happens if you don't buy my book on Amazon.com. Oh, I'm dead serious. You see, Amazon.com is pulling up all the internet stocks, or it was at least. The internet stocks are pulling up the stock market, or they were at least. Uh, the rising stock market is creating a wealth effect in this country, and that wealth effect was getting all of us to spend beyond our savings. And what that was doing was at a key time when we are telling the rest of the world, get with the new system, put on the golden straitjacket. We know it's wrenching. We know it's tough. We went through it in the 1980s. You're now in the 1980s. Do all these really hard things, but we will buy your goods if you do. And we are now the world's buyer of last resort. And it's hugely important at this time of transition. If you don't buy my book on Amazon.com, and Amazon.com falls and pulls down the internet stocks and the NASDAQ really pulls down the stock market and the falling stock market wipes out the wealth effect and the disappearing wealth effect gets us not to spend beyond our savings but rather to put up walls again or at least try to and we tell the rest of the world do all these really wrenching things yeah you Brazil, you Mexico get with the program, downsize, streamline, web up but we're not going to buy any of your stuff because we can't afford it. And Pat Buchanan's president now, and he wants us to put up some walls. That's when this system really gets tested, when there is a recession at the core, and we are the core. And the truth is, this new system has not been stress tested. I think another threat to the system is what I call the disease of overconnectedness. This is the real Y2K virus. The other one was a, was a blip. See, we're moving from the world of the internet to the world of the Evernet. And the Evernet means you will always be online wherever you go, through your pager, your cell phone, your watch, or your toaster. Because as you all know, anything with electricity now is having software written for it and is being linked into networks. And I believe the disease of overconnectedness, it will begin in the developed countries, but then spread down, is going to be the real Y2K virus. There was a story in the Israeli papers a couple months ago about an Israeli man arrested driving through Netanya with a cell phone in both ears, steering his car with his elbows. He's my poster boy for overconnectedness. If you want to see what the disease looks like at a very advanced stage, that's what it is. But we all recognize a little of ourselves in that story. You know, you call my office. People call my office all the time, ask my secretary, is Tom Friedman there? She says he's not here. They say, well, just connect me to his cell phone or his pager. The assumption now is that you're never out. You're always in. Out is over. Forget about out. Out is over. You're now always in. And when you're always in, you're always on. And when you're always on, what do you like? You're just like a, something else that's always on, a computer server. And how we manage this world of overconnectedness, I think, is going to be a very big social issue. Those are just a couple of the threats, and we can talk about others later. Let me simply say in conclusion, the trick with globalization is understanding that it's everything and its opposite. It can be incredibly empowering, incredibly disempowering, incredibly democratizing, incredibly authoritarian, incredibly particularizing, and incredibly homogenizing. The trick is learning how to get the best out of it and cushion the worst which is why I end that penultimate chapter of the book with a cartoon from the New Yorker. It's two Hell's Angels 
on their motorcycles talking to each other. And one says to the other, say, uh, how was your day? And the other says, well, advancing issues led to clients. <laughs> and that's sort of how I feel about this system. If we can just keep advancing issues leading to clients for more people in more countries on more days, we will be doing God's work. And that is America's mission. Thank you very much. given us substance, entertainment, connection, a human being. Now uh, go out, go to the expo, have some coffee, stop by the Heartland chapter at uh, our host chapter at the front of the expo. On your way by the uh, bookstore, by the tape. If you get it before noon, there's five dollars off. And I'll be there at 11 o'clock, tell them autograph. <laughs> and, and if you want to stop by the bookstore around 11 o'clock, you can get an autographed copy of the book. It won't cost you very much. And, but, or you can wait and buy it from Amazon.com. No, buy it here and now. I'll see you at 11 o'clock. Thank you. Let's go to the expo.